I think there is a good opportunity to still resolve the problem in Ireland amicably and in a very short space of time, I'd say 10, 15 years, I think we'll have, we'll have a totally new Ireland, cooperating and happy and quite rich and standing up to the bullying of the EU and uh, that's another story for another day. Can I go back a bit there yep. just for a while? Briefly, if you can talk about, uh, which you never covered before, we talked about the Princess Margaret affair. Um, we talked well, that about was after the, the 50s. Oh, I know that. And we talked about uh, the Brave Border, attack on the Brave Border, Brave Border. And then you ended up in prison, which we talked about. But you never talked to me about the escape. Could you briefly talk about, oh. about your escape from Limerick Prison? Well, you see, you're moving rapidly forward in time now because you're moving yeah. up to 1965. Yeah. This was between the ending of Operation Harvest and almost the beginning, in about yeah. 10 years, of the Northern Resistance. Yeah. In the middle of yeah. that is when we took our actions. Yeah. The South Kilkenny Unit was very active. Uh, it was something like uh, have gun will, will travel. <laughs> like, if there was a meaningful operation to be carried out, we were ready and we travelled and we did what we had to do. Um, the Braille Border was, of course, a very big attack. And so and now you're in, okay, so you're in Limerick. Yes, and after right. that, we wound up in Limerick yeah. Prison. But like all Republicans, um, the first thing I think of when you're in jail, for any length of time, if it's a week or so, you probably wouldn't be busting your head about knowing how you're going to escape. But if you see it, you still go. Um, it was to escape. And I was watching every possibility uh, of how it could be done. And if you get a book at the moment, published a few weeks ago by the late by the wife of the late Seamus Murphy, called uh, having as a way, it's a British prison term for escaping, where Murphy was one of the Arborfield raid men that was caught and was sentenced to life imprisonment, if you don't mind, in Britain. But he did escape out of Wakefield Prison with the help of Ioka, which were the political prisoners from Cyprus. And um, he escaped, but he died two years ago. But Seamus wrote a book of his memoirs. He's just been issued, having us away. And his story is totally from after the Arbourfield raid. He's in the police station awaiting trial and then coming down from the dock and then going to the different jails. And it's all about jail. It's a great story for anyone wants to, wants to study that. But his book concentrates all the time on wanting to escape and the different ruses and the different ways and I often find reading this book in the last few days that I kind of say you know so for Seamus that's a lot of what's a lot of I you could nearly have written that book for me setting up the chapters I felt that so I saw an opening and um, I had a uh, Luckily enough, some prisoners came in on short term, political Republicans, that um, Marcus Fogarty, particularly of Cashel, who was still very active, good Republican, and he was in for selling Easter lilies or something, which are banned because they want to crush the lily as well. <laughs> I put it to Marcus, the plan, but I needed help on the outside. So he was all for it and he went out. And Fair play, he organised the whole thing and it was up to me then to cut my way with hacksaws out of the jail and reach the main wall and a signal at a certain point. The rescue squad from outside would come up and throw a rope in over and that was it. So he went out and he set the whole thing up. In the meantime, I had managed to get hacksaw blades, and they were small little blades, a very small one. And by a series of ru ruses in my cell, I was, we were in a, 
uh, special powers of the prison to us, Motty Dunphy, and Ned Kelly, myself, two other South Kilkenny volunteers that were jailed for the Brave Border attack, uh, or adjoining cells. And um, we were on the top, I think it was four floors in this, it was really meant to be the remand prison for those waiting to go to trial. But because we were kind of specially prisoners, they didn't want to mix us into the, the main prison wing because they wanted to keep an eye on us, if you know what I mean. So we were put into this smaller prison with its own prison yard and things. And uh, four stories up, and there was three, three bars coming down the centre bar. And what I noticed about the centre bar, uh, all the bars, that instead of just going down into the, the sill uh, of the granite window sill and held in by lead, that and then it would go through a centre flat bar drilled through, buried in each side of the, the granite side of the window. But on the top, for some reason, I can never quite understand it. They had made a kind of a decorative top on them. They were sh shaped like the top of a, of a, of a, of a, an obelisk, you know? Four sides cut on them and the top of the point was just tipping. In other words, it wasn't buried into the stone. And I said to myself, crimes above, that's a weakness. Now, if I can get this inch and a quarter square bar going through the middle, turn on its side, and I could nick that across far enough, and I know the power of leverage, that maybe you might... Now you wouldn't have a big hole left, which you'd have a... I was very fit at the time, I wasn't as, <laughs> as big as maybe as I am now. And I figured you could possibly get out through it. And um, we got the hacksaw blades in by dubious means, a different story. And I made a little hacksaw by getting pieces of timber that some of the remand prisoners were chopping out in the yard during open cell time, making kindling to sell is sold by the jail to people for lighting fires and poor lad with little choppers making some these things. I got a few men by getting bits of, of leather lacing and things, uh, like managed to make a homemade frame of a hacksaw and that I could then put pressure on it and tension the braid so I had a little hacksaw. But the problem was it was a big big iron fold back window on the inside with little panes of glass for the winter time. And to get at the bars I'd take that out and that was a desperate weight. And if the window was quite high I'd have to get up on the end of the bed and try and catch it, manoeuvre it and lift it down and put it down now. The door into the cell would be just behind you with the the spy hole, which is known as the Judas hole, for you know, and you'd be regular, you wouldn't know when you'd be checked. So we found out after a while that by timing, the time the little thing would open and close, that in fact the wardens, or screws as people call them, uh, had a, a rude routine. And they'd come on at certain times and off at certain times, and it was very seldom that there'd be a sneak raid because the, people get uh, complacent. So they were kind of got complacent. So you could do really bet that you had the goods of an hour. Once the, you heard the thing click and sliding back, and you've been checked, you knew you had three quarters of an hour of fairly safe time. And that was time then to get over, get the window out, recover my blades from where I had them hidden, get up. And so the bars had luckily been painted white. So whatever bit of a cutting I was making, I just had to rub with white toothpaste since <laughs> after and put the window back in. And what I was afraid of is there's a, a, a secure every couple of, couple of weeks 
um, they come around the prison with big long ladders and they go up to the windows and this prison officer would have a, a lump hammer and he hits every one of the bars and if a bar instead of ringing like dong, if it went duck, they'd know it was interfering. So I had to get that window of time after they had done an inspection, I knew I had several weeks before they'd be back to hammer the bars. I also knew I had a three quarters an hour between each keyhole opening or spoiler, uh, Judas hole opening or inspection. So I walked away and it took me several days, terrible slow walk. At one time I knew the spare that would work, but by God it did. And then we we had a system of getting messages in and out, so the message was set for the escape on a certain night. At uh, 1 a.m. in the morning, which I reckon was about the best time. And we, um, I kept going. And I had to change it, and I got the message out by a couple of days to the next weekend because I forget now what, something delayed that I wasn't able to keep it there but I managed to get the, the change of date and, and the same, everything the same back on and in one way that helped without me knowing it. So I finished the cotton until I finally by catching the bar finally felt the littlest give and once I knew I had a tiny little move in it and I used bits of timber I'd smuggled in the handle of a broken brush as well to use leverage against other bar until I could see there was a tiny little movement. So I knew then that if I did that long enough the fracture would come just over the centre flat bar where I'd been cutting and I'd snap it out and that's what happened. In the meantime, I was taking sheets, when I'd be giving the sheets out once a week off the bed, a very strong kind of a, I think it used to be made in Mount Joy in the weaving press up there by the prisoners, a very coarse kind of a, like a sail of a boat or something, you know. And um, so when you'd be putting them in the basket for your change, you got your new sheet for the week. I would, by the way, put it in when I would eat. They were putting water or looking somewhere or some little distraction. I put sheet went back in. I had spare sheets over about three weeks. I was gathering sheets and doubled them up under my mattress and they never cut down. And then tearing them into strips and then knotting them and I made plenty of rope. I put a lot of rope then in the last few days. Luckily the cells weren't searched. Occasionally you would get a complete cell search, but and I just all worked out okay. And I started keeping a certain amount of my butter instead of putting it on the bread. Now we were the only ones getting butter. The three of us, the four other prisoners were getting margarine. <laughs> In a way the state always does recognise unofficially that we're not common type of prisoner, you know. <laughs> and there's always that little bit of sympathy with some of the screws that might have old nationalist leanings. You have others of course that fucking hang you up with it. And um, I was smoothing the butter on myself. That was my plan to try and grease the bars because I knew I only had a very narrow entrance that if I could possibly get through it. And I was using the end of my bed where it was like a military bed with a kind of an iron, an iron uh, um, frame coming up around the mattress at the edge of a bar and between the spring, metal spring of the bed here and the top of the bar there was about that much of a gap. Uh, I had measured it the window would be something that width. Could I get through it so I'd be there stark naked trying to get through the end of the bed and that's where I use some butter as well. And I managed by contorting my body and getting one arm ahead and my head tucked into my elbow, into my shoulder, that I could actually 
lengthen myself and managed to get through it. But one evening I was doing this practice again and I heard the signal from what he'd done for next door, kind of coughing and by the way he dropped his chamber pot or something. I don't expect a visit from a checkup. And I had to get out from under the I was jammed, I was trapped. Starting at the edge of the bed. <laughs> and between just sheer determination and I both I wouldn't say panic, but the how after all may work. I mean if you look in and saw a naked man stuck at the end of the bed like I mean Jason, I'd be up I'd be up in the mental hospital, you know. <laughs> and I just got out in time, leapt on the floor, and grabbed my chamber pot by the way, and went over towards the door, and left with the flap open, and I saw the eye, and I was Psh! I said, you mind what I can have a wee wee in privacy or something, just, he just kept going. But I was covering the room, because my window was out, because I'd been working on it. And he would have seen the bed and said, what the hell, like, what's happening with the bed? So, we were lucky. On the night of the escape, everything went according to plan. I put all my clothes in a pillowcase, put one of my ropes as far down as I could, and let it go. I actually had wrapped the bar out of the window with a two. I'd love to have it today, but I left it in the house in Dublin. It's never, ever been come back again. I took the bar with me, one as a weapon and one as a souvenir. <laughs> and also, if I had to get over the main wall myself, my spare rope, I'd use the bar as a counterweight over the wall, hoping to catch it something and climb up and do a solo escape if I had to. So it's, you know, I had plenty of rope made, as I say. I got through the window, but getting through that window was the hardest thing I in my life, and dangerous, because I had to go head first. And when I went head first, I remember 30 feet off the ground and it's all slab stones on them. I was trying to go out head first and this little narrow window. I just, what the hell was it at all? 19 inches by one way and I think it was, was it 11 inches or 10 inches or something, maybe 9. It was, I know I could barely get through it. And it's like toothpaste going out of a tube and out. And then I had to hold the outer bar and try and get the rest of my hips out. And Christ, they were the hardest. And I'm hanging up head first down over the yard and saying, I'm either going to kill myself here or I'm going to be stuck here or I'd have to call for help and you'd have to get lads in with the settling torches to cut me out of it. But I got through it and I tore my hips all right a bit, you know, on the, but lucky the butter was a great job. And I managed to twist some hold. I was young, I was fit. And I went down the rope and dropped into the yard, ran under cover of the shapes that I'd been chopping timber, I'd lean to, put on my clothes as quickly as I could, and my shoes, and climbed out over the small roof, it was an inner wall of the work yard, out where the patrols would be outside, there was no one around, dropped, and I couldn't figure out, I didn't see any wardens anywhere. But luck, luck was with me that night. I dropped down and headed for the main wall. And I grabbed a handful of gravel and slung it out exactly in the point planned. Nothing. Grabbed another one, slung it. Nothing. Oh Christ, I said, maybe they didn't get the cancellation order and the change of date. Maybe. God Almighty, so I was starting to get back to my, getting the bar out ready to <laughs> tie up and try my own rope, could I sling it over with the bar, I think I'm wise up but whoever. Next moment I heard thump, and I listened, thump, I couldn't make out what this thump was, but I was clear just outside the wall, it was the lads throwing up the rope, <laughs> and they couldn't get head over it, I kept hitting the wall and dropping. And I think it was Marcus or one of the lads in the end who were outside the rescue squad from Tipperary um, had climbed in or had come into the wall from the, near the side road 
known as Lover's Lane, not into the store, but a few lovers suit or whatever. But they, they couldn't, and in the end, one of them, in sheer desperation, made an unmerciful throw, and next minute, edged up against the sky, I saw this rope coming in, and it dropped. But it didn't drop down far enough, it kind of caught, got the knots on it, and it had caught on top of the wall. And I'm still down looking up the rope, and Jay, could it? I don't know how I got up to it, because it was at least the height of the ceiling or more, the bottom knot, but I had to put big knots in it. And I just tied the, what you call it, the, I don't know why I was determined to bring this, the bar with me, but I did. I put the bar back into it pillowcase tied it to be the back of his trousers with the belt and I went back back as far as I could and I ran like a cat and just slept and grabbed the wall and tore up. I mean I couldn't do it now. And got the last knot and then got up. When they came to the top of the wall the problem was there was a, a flat stone that came out over the wall so there was a, a gap. And when they got up there then the rope was taut over it, you couldn't get your hand over and you couldn't get it over to get the other side of the wall and that was, that was an awful job getting, that, that was one of the hardest of all was that, just that last little top but I managed to, I was yours as said by getting every little, my toes into the, I, I'd almost sticking like a cat and trying to get the side of the rope and managed to get up and over it held the rope and jumped and got the knots acted as a brake but I got halfway down and the whole lot came and I dropped about 15 feet. But I was young, it was grass luckily. The lads were there. One minute, roll up the ropes, car to other car. I'm shoved in, lads jumped in. Tom Sullivan and the lads were oh. on. We were out of Limerick and in Tipperary, I'd say. Like that. They never found I'd escaped till morning. They didn't know, only when they went to open us up. And then Kelly, up to the day he died, said the greatest, loveliest music he ever heard in his life was to hear that dong, 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 dong. the alarm bell rang for half an hour. They never switched it off in the morning. All the other prisoners in their cells, the ward had got out something up. They were cheering and roaring up. It was pandemonium. They searched every inch of the prison. They blocked Limerick off. Shut my was off having a good meal in Tipperary at the time. So that was... And what was the lucky thing? You said you were lucky. The lucky thing was that the governor's daughter was having her 21st birthday that night. And the, the governor had used his house, which is within the main prison wall, a special private entrance out. His daughter's party was there. So she had invited all her friends and relatives and all that night the prison up till about 2 or 3 in the morning there was a party, dancing and music and everything going on and all the officers on duty were kind of around there and letting people in the governor's gate and they had extra lights on and the escape committee on the outside were about to go when they saw all the cars pulling up to the prison and they saw all the lights and they said, oh my God, Richard must have been caught. He hasn't made it and they were about to leave <coughs> and Marcus Fawlty said, I don't see any guards though, but all these cars and people and lights and all of them, it should be dark. So he said, uh, there's no guards. Yes, he said, we don't know what's happening. He said, listen, he said, if he's prepared to take the chance, sure, we are, we're not doing anything. We're just, they can't try, you know, we'll just hang around and we'll have a look. And they hung around. <laughs> and they sat in the car and I think they were uh, pretending to be working couples. <laughs> and they stuck to the exact time. And Marcus says, we'll hold on. We'll take a chance because we don't see cars, but we don't know what's going on. And next minute, a shower of gravel came down on the car. They left out another show. Action stations, rope belt up the that's and that's the story. Oh, very good. Thank you very yeah. much, Richard Beale. Yeah.